Um, but before we get going, um, I just wanted to start off by kind of just talking a little bit about why we're here today, obviously to hang out with uh, the amazing Mr. Rudy Sarzo, because who doesn't want to hang out with Rudy Yay. Sarzo? Um, <laughs> um, but I'm going to start out just by letting us uh, just kind of start like, by talking about what we're here for. Um, so uh, today's event is actually sponsored by uh, the Battle to Beat Cancer um, and the Lewin Fund. And I'm going to talk to you guys just very briefly about what that is. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us if you are live on Facebook or if you're joining us on Zoom. Um, thank you, Rudy, by the way, for, for doing this and for hanging out. My with pleasure. Us. My pleasure. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. We'll, uh, we'll figure it out. You know what? Ah. Is, you got it? Yeah. <laughs> the joys of figuring out the tech of all this, right? Um, okay. Yeah. And so uh, for those of you who are wondering who is the strange redheaded guy talking at me and trying to help figure out the tech of it all, uh, my name is Parker. I am a part of the Battle to Be Cancer team. Um, and basically what we're doing right now um, throughout the month of October and probably even beyond that is we're raising funds for this amazing organization called the Lewin Fund to Fight Women's Cancers. Um, and they're doing amazing work to battle cancer. Um, they're focusing on programs that specialize in quality of life improvements um, and preventative strategies that directly impact women battling cancer as well as their families and their communities. Um, and they also invest in innovative research that focuses on improving that quality of life for women um, and also brings us closer to finding treatments and cures, right? Um, it's a great cause. And if you guys want to donate now, um, head over to justgiving.com slash I am talent, which is a group that Rudy is a part of um, and is so, uh, so kindly agreed uh, to, to help us out and hang out tonight and just be a part of this battle to beat cancer. Um, you know, we will be putting a link to that in the chat periodically throughout the event today, um, as well as showing it on the screen, just like you are seeing now. Um, so yeah, you guys can go to, to that link. Um, <clears throat> uh, and if you can, just go over there, go ahead and donate something, you know, every little bit counts. Um, you know, if you can't, we know that this year has been really hard with COVID and many of us have lost jobs or have cut back on hours and whatnot. Um, but you know what, you can go to battletobeatcancer.com and find other ways that you can get involved. You can share your story, which I know Rudy is gonna be talking about his story and his connection to why this matters to him, right? Um, you can host your own event or your own battle. Um, you can share this with friends and family um, and just everything, every bit of awareness, every bit of um, prevention, right? All of that helps save lives, right? Um, and with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it back over to Rudy and Jason. Well, and, and if, 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 if for no other reason, um, you know, donate money because I love women and we should keep them all alive. Uh, it's very important to me. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so Rudy, I wanted to, um, to kind of go back in, in, in history a little bit um, and, and maybe talk about what got you playing bass initially. What got me playing bass initially was one guy in a garage where the band used to rehearse. I have moved to Miami and I came to, I went to, you know, each, each block had a band. That was our social network back then. And so I went into the garage with the band was rehearsing that belonged to my block. And I introduced myself and I said, uh, I want to join your band. And he says, well, he stole my old craftsman acoustic guitar in my hand. And he said, oh, well, we got too many guitar players. But if you want to play bass, you can join the band. That's what got me into playing the bass. <laughs> that was the thing, huh? That was the guy, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you were the guy who got me into playing rock music because I, yeah, I started up playing pop rock bass, um, ah. and then listened to Sly Stone, a uh, uh, fresh, fresh album, but we got really into rock music. And you were the guy that had feel and, and was, mm -hmm. was playing something other than just roots, thirds and fifths and octaves and, and fills that, that actually meant something with passing notes. And, and yeah. I was like, wow, I, 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 I understand this, like this dude's doing things. Where did you get that from? 
So I'm listening to the same things that you listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Graham, you know, when, when I was a kid, we had top 40. And if, you, if you're going to play top 40, you got to play everything that's on the radio. So it's like the Family Stone was a staple of the radio, you know. Yeah. And trying to figure out what, what, what is this guy doing? Oh, there's a video. You know, like uh, some, some TV show will have him on, you know, with Slide the Family Stone and go, that's what he's doing. Okay, so then disco happened. And I'm living in, my, in Florida, so disco was disco, wasn't you. just happening. It <laughs> took over the whole thing, you know. We couldn't play rock anymore. So it's like, if you want to play, you got to play disco. Now, for a bass player, disco was awesome. It was for the guitar players going, what, what, yeah. what, that, that wasn't so good, you know. But for me, it was like, oh, my God, this, this, is, this is fantastic. So, you know, as far as old school thumping, you know, Anthony Jackson and, of course, Larry Graham, uh, Brothers Johnson, you know, yeah. I, all I, of that. I have, uh, I have, I have uh, Louis Johnson's old bass for yeah. me. Uh, with, with, a, with a Mutron built into it and an old uh, a boss chorus that his tech built for him. Wow. <laughs> how, did you, how did you wind up with that? He was, he was at some place, I think it was called High Voltage Guitars or something in L.A. and was walking in and was going to sell it. And I ran into him on the way in. And I was like, I, I, I'm, I don't care how much that costs. <laughs> I want it. <laughs> I mean, he, he was brutal on the instrument. Uh, what condition was it? Um, you know, it's it's not in great condition. It was like a, a very uh, basic box that it was built into with a custom little preamp thing. Um, I don't know what the circuit for the preamp is, but it lets you boost it so the Mutron will basically trigger right on every note. Uh, and then with the chorus at the end, it's it's really bizarre. And oh. I've, I've had it since, I think I bought it in 98 or something. Uh, but really cool and, and, and just a part of history to me. I bet, him. can you imagine all the Quincy Jones records that, that he probably it's made, made with that? I'm sure, I'm sure. Wow. Uh, you know, that, that really changed my life. Uh, but the, wow. yeah, it, it's really, really funny that you that that you were a fan of Larry's also because that was like, that, well, you that, have to be. Yeah, that was my entire thing, and then just hearing, you know, now it makes a whole lot of sense of, of why you were the first rock guy that I went. Uh, I I think something play. that I, a lot I, a lot of people don't you know don't I maybe it just went over there you know while I was doing it when I was touring with Ozzy. The song, uh, Suicide Solution, um, I thumped it. Yeah. I wasn't because, because I played with my fingers. So I wanted to get that staccato thing, yeah. kind of like the pick, you know. I yeah. went, uh, uh, and I was always thumping the bass back then, you know. It's so, it, 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 is, it is so cool just to hear that, 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 that connection made it through. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's... Uh, you know, but growing up in Miami, not only was disco, but it was such a multicultural scene. You know, not only do you have Cuban music, which is, you know, what I grew up with, but you had Jamaican music. Uh, of course, you had the, uh, the pop that was on the radio, so it could be anything like country music, you know. Uh, so it, 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 and then, you know, whatever top 40 hits. We, we had to play songs like You're Having My Baby. Paul Anka, you having my baby? And then turn around and play, you know, smoke on the water. <laughs> did you ever, did you ever have any, have any run-ins with uh, Jaco Pastorius? Yeah, well, I, well, you know, he was the local bass hero. Yeah. Jaco, you know, I mean, everybody, you know, Jaco was the guy, you know, you know, and, um, uh, one of the things that really separated him from everybody else was that, that, that not only did he play bass, but he was also music director. Uh, there was a club called Bachelor's, yeah, musical director. Uh, he was musical director at a, play, at a club called Bachelor's Three. So whenever there was an artist, let's say Temptations were coming in, they didn't have a band. So he had to put the charts and the band together for, for that. Yeah. 
So he also he also played piano. So some some nights it would be the piano guys. Some nights it would be playing bass. You know. Wow, I I actually yeah. was fortunate enough to take a bass lesson with him uh, wow. during this brief period of time that he was living in San Francisco. Uh, and and I I had to I ended up paying him with a burrito and a forty ounce of beer. <laughs> It, it was very much towards the end. You got your money's worth. <laughs> I, I absolutely did. But, but he, you know, it, it, it also was one of those lessons where we just sat around and talked crap. And uh, he said, you know, you're majoring your minor scale. So all you got to do is just go out and play. Just go out and play. There's not a whole lot I can show you past that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's... You know, it's like, what would God say to you if you took a bass lesson from from God? Right. <laughs> it, it, it's it's going to be go have experiences and figure this out for yourself and be unique. Yeah. So he said exactly the same thing. Yeah. It, 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 was, yeah. it was really a trip. Like I sat, I came out of there with so much confidence because it's like, oh, I already have what I need to have to be able to do this now is just work. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that was it. There was no magic to be had. You know, there was no amount of like, oh, I'll show you this trick that's going to make you good. It was go out and play with everybody every night if you can. Is that what, what you were looking for? I was looking for the trick. I was young. I was looking for that, that you know, if if I if I go do this, I, I you know he's going to teach me some magic because he's the greatest bass player I've ever heard, and, and walked out of there learning, basically like what led to songwriting and producing and everything else as opposed to learning a technique, you know, like it, it was a huge gift, it it, it really was it, it uh, you know if, if he had just showed me some Jocko stuff. I'd have just obsessed on that until I got it right instead of let me learn where everything lands on the fretboard and, and how this works and, and how all this stuff, you know, uh, writes songs and, and writes parts and, and works out. You know, I, I think it was the best lesson I ever had. Um, you know, I, I, I spent, this is basically how I spent my, the last, let's see, 55 years, whatever with an instrument in my hand yeah listening to records yep. listening to the radio then listening to more records and to more radio then at some point listening to the composers in the band which kind of like okay now you okay these are uh, feel coming up with my own bass line sometimes they had some ideas some points producers coming up with bass lines and so on. And then I went back more into tutorials because they're so available on social media. So there's so much to learn. Absolutely. And then it's not until lately, and it's taken me into a whole different path, that I started listening to the music in my head. It's the whole thing. And, and I got it early, thank you. Yeah. That's it. This is this is my biggest source of information. Because I mean, I've taken so much in that at some point I gotta say, it's like a re refrigerator. You, you can put so much food in there. You gotta well, fill start food. eating. Start it out. Yeah. Yeah. Start feeding yourself from what's in that box. And, and and it really is that. It's like you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't know how to process it. Right. If, if, if you don't know when to apply it and when not to, um, you know, when, when, when you're hearing a song, you know that it doesn't have enough and that you can contribute to that and feed that to make it have enough or that you know that it has enough. And all you got to do is just lay back and be cool. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's kind of the difference. You know, it's like you're not trying to show off or be the guy you're trying to be part of the rhythm section, you're trying to be part of the song, and you're just trying to make the song work, I think that's the job. 
you know, I mean, you have way more experience than I do, but I, I well, feel like that's the job. <laughs> well, I, I think ultimately it's to create, not recreate, but to actually create. And, and, and we fall into, into the, the pit of even if at one point, let's say you create a, a, a record, you, you create a record, then you got to go out every night and recreate it. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, and, to me, the, yeah. worst, the worst things I've ever done, you know, have just kind of been behind ego shit. You know, it's like, oh, I can play a whole bunch of notes here. I can do this, that, and the other, as opposed to just serve the purpose. Uh, and, and, you know, I listen back to those things, and I'm embarrassed. Uh, and, and I listen back to the things where it was like, I did the right thing for the song. I did the right thing for the band, uh, so on and so forth. Those are the things I'm proud of. You know, it, it, it's a, absolutely it's a really tough line because we all can't be Billy Sheehan. You know, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people try and get there. It, it, and as mm -hmm. amazing as he is, and as much as mm -hmm. he serves the songs, mm -hmm. um, there, there's, you know, dude has a technicality that most people don't have mm -hmm. and, and a musicality that most people don't have. And that's what makes it mm -hmm. unique. But I think we're all unique in our own way of how we interpret how we can help a song out. Absolutely. And, Absolutely, and, and, that, and that's the difference. You know, I, I was listening to Tower Power the other day because Rocco passed. Yeah, he did. I was just amazed at how much incredible stuff he did that I, I, I just hadn't even processed yet, you know? Like, I hadn't gone through and been like, I listened to the songs passively my entire life, uh, but then, you know, listened deeply uh, and and man, <laughs> that cat was so musical and so right. Uh, you know, I, I, there was nothing in, in any of those songs that didn't serve the song, even though he was playing incredibly technically. It, 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 was, it, it, was, it was another revolution. <laughs> you know, a, you just have these every now and again where, where there's, there's that moment where, where you realize just how great someone is. Yeah, and, and that's one of the beautiful things about being a musician in one band, because you become such a irreplaceable component of that sound that if for some reason, you know, you're not there anymore, well, there, you know, if the band needs to carry on, they have to honor your legacy yep. by having somebody come in and be go go with those fundamentals that 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 you know let's say Rocco you have to have somebody who actually has those chops yeah those chops and be able to like really interpret his ideas yeah and and just the way that like especially with him just you know his 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 feel and and being that melodic <laughs> Mm -hmm. with that right hand that was playing so many notes yeah <laughs> you know, like, oh yeah I, I i would never get there i could spend yeah. the entirety of the rest of my life and you know would be lucky to get halfway there um it, pretty incredible but you you've done you've done something very very similar in 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 rock music where where you know the, the, the amount of influence you've had on, on other bass players has been incredible, you know? Well, like, thank you, yeah. thank you, but, you know, like, like you were saying, let's say, let's say going back to Rocco, you know, he's known as the bass player for, for Tower of Power. Right. And there's something that I, that I really envy about a, somebody that, you know, in baseball, you call that a lifer, somebody who wears the yeah. uniform for all the whole career, you know? And, and, and in my case, it's, you know, I, I've, I've always wanted to be a team member, team. And for example, when, when I got the call to join Ozzy, I was playing in a band called Angel. Yeah. So I was playing in a band. And, you know, I turned it down because, you know, say, ah, you know I'm, a, I'm a band guy. I'm not really a backup guy, you know. I really, I really am not a backup guy. I, I, I don't even go on stage thinking I'm a backup guy. I'm thinking like, wow, what a cool band we got, you know? 
<laughs> and that's my mindset, you know. And uh, so I turned it down, and it wasn't until the next day that Ozzy called me, and by then Kevin DeBro, who I was living at his place, had yelled at me and put some sense into my head about the fact that I was beyond broke. <laughs> I was yeah. sleeping on his floor. And the opportunity to play with Randy Rhodes again, make some money, and so on. And I never thought I was going to get a second call, but I did, you know. And then, uh, you know, when, when I left Ozzy, I, 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 I joined what, 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 what was a band, Quiet Riot, four equal guys, you know. Uh, and then after that, uh, White Snake. And David, David always made it us feel like we were a band, you know, and in and, and, and our hearts, we, we were a band, you know, so it wasn't like, oh, I mean, David's, you know, backup band. I, ne I, ne I never go on stage like that. Uh, he, even Dio, Ronnie, with his name, Dio, he never made any, any of us feel like this is a backup band. I think rock and roll is all about, it's all about that. You're not really in a backup band. You are yeah, in a band. Here's the other side of it. Like you were yeah. the bass player in the high point, the most successful point of all of the bands you've been in, for the most part. You in know, the 80s. There, yeah, there, in there, the there, 80s. There, there, there's something to that, you know. It, like yeah. that. That is because you put a hundred percent in because it. You were in the band, you know. Like there, there was yeah. no reason not to put everything into it. You weren't a hired gun, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Necessarily, it was it was the band attitude. You know, it, it, it's yeah. a thing. Like you can commit to to putting your heart and soul into it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when it feels that way, when you know, yeah. for, for when I know I'm a hired gun. I'm a hired gun and I also have other responsibilities in life and so on and so forth. I'll do the best that I can. If I'm in a band, like yeah. I got a stake uh, and, and, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta put a thousand percent in because I, I got a stake in this. Yeah. That's something really interesting. I, I did, I was doing a session actually in a studio, which is one of the very few occasions because I, I do everything at home yeah. Especially d due to uh, COVID, and uh, but this you know people that that I'm I'm pretty close to, and we all wore masks and everything, and we had social distancing, and I was going through passes, and I, I was having difficulty because I'm wearing this mask, and sometimes that gets in your way breathing, because yeah. you know music is all about that breathing. Yeah, you can't I really have hard time just going to the grocery store with a mask. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's why I stay home a lot because you know if I'm gonna go out, I gotta wear a mask. Yeah. So, and sometimes, you know, it gets in the way of my breathing, but especially if I'm playing, because if you stop breathing, your, your blood, your circulation stops and you start getting cramps. Yeah. It's one of the things that I become very aware of when I play, the older I get, you know, you, you, you learn more things, you know? Yeah. And one of the things that I learned is to have proper breathing when I'm playing to avoid cramps, you know? Right get my circulation going. So I'm laying, you know, I, I, they sent me an MP3, so I was kind of familiar with the song, and then there was little nuances that were targeted when I was laying it down. And I, I had some multiple passes, and then on the last pass, that's where all everything came together. And we were talking about that, you know, the, the, the guys that I was doing a session for and, and the producer. And I was mentioning, he says, you know what? In this last pass, I felt like I was a member of the band. Yeah. I wasn't doing a session anymore. It's a, I'm in the band. Yeah. It, it, for, me, it's, for, for me, it's almost a meditation, right? So I just get to this spot where it's, uh, it, it, I'm not thinking anymore, right? And, yeah. And it's yeah. just happening. Those are the takes. You know, like yeah. those are always the ones that get kept. It, it's the ones that I'm not worried about, and I'm not, you know, my nose isn't having an itch or something that I'm thinking about or some other nonsense. My yeah. girlfriend's not texting me or calling me, <laughs> whatever's going on. It's just getting into that meditation, and it always yeah. just, you know, it, it, usually it doesn't even need to be edits. It's just, you got it, dude. It's like thanks. 
I, I yeah. appreciate it. And I know when I'm in that spot, I know when I'm entering it, like this yeah. is going to be good. Uh, yeah. And, and that, that is one of the best feelings that I've had in life. You know, like it, it really is. Cause you, you spend your whole life trying to get to that spot of, of, you know, just being able to walk in and do something great or something that you feel is great. Who cares what anybody else thinks? Uh, it, but, but once you get into that flow state, it, it's, it's all good. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. can't, you can't do any wrong from there. Yeah, you, absolutely. You, you really can't. So, absolutely. so, so of, of the, the 10 trillion shows you've played in life, what are the, what are the three most memorable? The last one and the one before and the next one. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I I can break it down per band. I would say with Ozzy was Day of the Green, 1981, 4th of July. Uh, you know, I was there. I was there. Yeah, that <laughs> one. I remember. I, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> the miniature guy who couldn't see over anybody. That's else. you. This that guy over there. Yeah way back to the crowd yeah that was me <laughs> that, was you. that one because of all the obvious you know back in the day we didn't have social media that if you if you're a hot up-and-coming band you know there's a bunch of people that can actually see you in youtube before you get you you know you get to to the next gig you know uh so it was all word of mouth and by July, let's see, we started out in April. So by July, April, May, June, July, yeah, like three, three months later, there was a buzz going on from coast to coast about this, this, uh, this guitar player named Randy Rhodes, you know, that was playing with Ozzy Osbourne and, you know, and so on. Which so kind of changed the, the world. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that gig, that was definitely, you know, we knew, uh, because this is what happened. I, I, I don't know if you recall this, but we, we came on really early. We came on like uh, what, 10.45 in the morning, something like that. And uh, so we were like a last minute addition just because Bill Graham had heard that the band was really hot and he just wanted us on. And, and it, was, uh, it coincided with the routing that we had. We were, I think we played Santa, Santa Cruz the night before. So then we hit San Francisco. Catalyst in, in Santa Cruz. Yeah. Yeah, probably the Catalyst or, or you know, an outdoor venue. Yeah, I think it was the uh, the university. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was still going yeah. On. Yeah, and then, and then we just continued going up. I think Seattle was after that or, or Vancouver or something like that. But anyways, it was part of the routing. So uh, we got added and we were supposed to do like a 30-minute set and we got off the stage and I'm, I'm like half naked on my way to the, the, uh, the trailers. This is the Oakland, Oakland Stadium. And, and I hear Bill Graham yelling, you guys got to come back on. Everybody's going eggshell. You know, you guys need to, you know, do a couple more songs, whatever. So I'm like putting my clothes back on and then we, we hit the stage again. And by, by the crowd reaction, we, we felt like we're onto something. Because that was the very first big stadium show, you know. And when you get the whole stadium, you know, on your side, you, you know you're doing something right, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So with that, I'm going to interject real quick. Um, we yes. actually have some, some questions from some people hanging out on <laughs> Facebook. Um, for those of awesome. you who are still on Facebook, um, go back and scroll back in the comments. You guys can actually come hang out on Zoom if you want. Um, and come say hi to Rudy and um, hang out. It's kind of fun over here. Um, and so I love that you're talking about sort of like your favorite just like stories from like, you know, the stadiums and like, you know, some of the favorite shows you've done. Um, but uh, JD Robinson asks you, Rudy, uh, who is your favorite drummer to record with? He, he said he likes hearing about like who it was fun to perform with, but he wants to know who your favorite drummer to record with was. His name is Mac Hine. All right. Yeah, if you put, put that together, it's machine. 
<laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm only kidding. Uh, a drum machine that I record with, well, you know, I recorded with a few unbelievable drummers. Uh, Frankie Benali, of course, we made that uh, that iconic uh, record, uh, Metal Health and Condition Critical together. And uh, Tommy Aldrich, we have done a couple of live records and a studio record with uh, with a white snake called Slip of the Tongue. You know, we did the uh, the, the Sabbath re-recordings on a record called Speak of the Devil and also Tribute. So Tommy Aldrich and Simon Wright, who I got to play with uh, in Dio. We made a, a, a live DVD record, you know, combination like that. I mean, there's so many and they're, and they're all so different. You know, they'll bring their own language and their own, their own feel to the music, you know. And uh, yeah. Yeah, right now I'm in a band called The Guess Who and we have the, the, the founding member drummer, Gary Peterson. And it's really interesting playing with him because he started playing drums before rock and roll existed. So a lot of the, a lot of the early rock and roll musicians, pioneers, they came from big band, swing, you know, jazz, you know, massive musical vocabulary that they were able to incorporate that into rock and roll. You know, so a lot of the Guess Who songs have a lot of nuances and articulations, which are not necessarily associated with uh, like 80s rock and roll, which is more arena rock, because the, the bigger the places became, the less nuance the drummers had, because when you're playing in such a big place that it's actually not even designed for music, like basketball arenas are designed for to play basketball. <laughs> Especially back in the 80s. Nowadays, you know, sometimes when they build a big, uh, like an arena, they'll take acoustics into consideration. But that wasn't the case, you know, uh, 40, 40 years ago. And uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so to play with somebody who's got such a incredible vocabulary of grooves and dynamics, you know, that is, that is, ugh. After me playing for so many years, to still be able to 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 play what I heard, what I grew up listening to on the radio, that type of playing, that's really a blessing, it really is. Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting, and I love how you kind of mentioned how, like, like you said, you know, playing in spaces where you know, like that nuanced drum, like drumming, is not really meant for, right? But you know, obviously, like things have changed over time, um, and that kind of plays into how I'm sure just the industry has changed so much, right? Of just music in general. Um, and so Don Watson asked on Facebook. Um, she said, aside from playing and writing music, um, so who was your biggest influence for when it came to just learning the business and like the industry side of music? I had the best teacher, Sharon Osborne. Everything that I learned about the music industry, well, I would say 90% because it's, it's always evolving and changing, but the nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts, Sharon. Sharon, I mean, yeah, she was our manager before she even married Ozzy. So, you know, she was, she was the band manager and she traveled with us every single day, which is not something that managers do. Managers usually stay in the office taking care of business. And by Sharon make sure that everything was spot on every single night. So she was in the bus with us and I just watched her, which is, which is great uh, to be able to go on the road, play with the band, but also get a business education at the same time. And it's, and it's there if you're willing to listen. If you're willing to like keep your ears open, your eyes open and your mouth closed and just take it all in. Just like if you were in a classroom, you're listening to your teacher, you know, and paying attention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm scrolling through. If you guys want to add more questions, I think I've got a couple more that I've seen. Uh, Scott Ransom wants to know who your favorite singer is. Ooh. <laughs> I, I have so many favorite singers for so many reasons. And, uh, oh my God. Uh, 
somebody that I could really connect with emotionally uh, would be Ronnie James Dio. And I'll tell you why. Because Ronnie, and this is a really good question because, for example, and I'm going to make uh, name two incredible singers that, that, that I work with. Uh, David Coverdale and Ronnie James Dio. And if anybody's interested, you can, you can actually go on YouTube and watch these songs as examples. Them singing the same song. And let's say you have David Coverdale who originally recorded a Deep Purple song named Mistreated. Right? You got David, he's singing it. And David is a blues singer. And usually as a blues singer, you're singing about heartbreak, heartbreak. It's a lot of heartbreak in those songs, right? Which that's, that's part of David's identity. You know, I'm a blues singer. I'm going to sing about the relationship between men and women, heartbreak and all of that. Okay. More, you know, a lot of the times, right? Then you have Ronnie James Dio singing the same song. And there's a video of him with the band Rainbow. Now, this is the connection. Richie Blackmore was the guitar player in Deep Purple who co-wrote that song. And he was the founding member of Rainbow. So, he, so there's music that he brought with him from Deep Purple into Rainbow because they were his compositions too. And then you have Ronnie James Deal singing the same song, but he's singing it from a different angle. He's singing it not from heartbreak, but from overcoming, overcoming. Uh, this, this is a theme that ran through Ronnie's lyrics, through his career from Rainbow to Black Sabbath to the band Dio. It was not about the heartbreak. It was about being overcoming, being mistreated, you know. I mean, Ronnie was great at singing songs about slaying dragons. You know what I mean? I'm victorious. You know, that was his attitude. That was his identity. So to me, a great singer is a singer that is true to themselves. There's an honesty that comes out in your music because if you're not, you're not, it, it, it's, you're fake. You're pretending, you're pretending to be something that you're not. Even though you might not be at peace with who you are because you want to like, okay, I don't wanna be a person that's into, you know, I don't wanna be uh, known as being heartbroken all the time and so on or whatever. Okay, work on it, work on it and, and, you know, fix that and then sing about it. But just like David was true to himself about heartbreaks, Ronnie James Dio was true to himself about being victorious, overcoming. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, I, I love that you like, that you talk about how like they could sing the same song and you know, the lyrics are the same, right? But like how you hear that as both a listener and how you play that as a bassist and as a singer, like that's different, right? Because like, as we come to that song, as we come to whether we're reading something, looking at a piece of art, looking at a piece of music, you know, it just depends on who you are and where you are in that moment, right? Like if we listen to a song when you're 20, it's going to be different than when you listen to it when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50, right? Um, and so I love that you're like, you know, that you're shining that light on that. that. Um, and then we have, that actually leads perfectly into, we got some great questions from, from you guys <laughs> awesome fans. Um, Michelle asks on Zoom, um, kind of, I think she kind of like leans into that like diversity of like music and bands, right? And like this idea that, like you said, you've got, you know, somebody who's like that, that sadness and that sort of like, um, versus like that, like overcoming, right? And so like there's that mm -hmm. diversity um, and you've, you know, two were so many diverse bands, right? Like you know, Ozzy, Quiet Riot, Dio, White Snake. You know, all these. Um, and she says, "I know I've heard you say you always try to be the best bass player for that band, yeah. but how do you prepare for each different or diverse kind of music?" Good question. Uh, one of the best sources I have right now is uh, the internet. 
I, I study, I study. Let's say when I recently, when I joined the Guess Who, I studied there, and I still have them on my phone, the original recordings. Then I study how the band has morphed through the years because you can't really play the same song exactly the same way. I mean, it's otherwise you become a machine. So as you become a more refined musician, there's certain fundamentals that get refined also in your music, you know? And uh, so I look at everything and then I look at the way that I play, it's I meet the band because I, I, my, my philosophy is I'm joining the band. The band is not joining me. Whereas I play with musicians that they're, they're coming into the group that I'm in and they're trying to change things to, for their comfort zone. They bring their comfort zone and put the, try to bring, like, attack the band <laughs> into that comfort zone. And it's like, no, no, that's, that's not. You're joining the band. You know, there's a certain essence that it's, it's, it's asked of your role to respect the legacy of the band and the fans, because the fans want to hear the music a certain way, the way that it was originally recorded, you know, or performed that they're used to. So, you know, there's always, I'm always very, very uh, aware of that. And then at some point we get so comfortable with each other and, and that we start evolving from that. And there's, uh, I've, I've been in some beautiful, beautiful evolutions of bands that I, that I joined, that it's just, it still retains the essence of the original, but it's kind of like gives her our own flavor, her own sound. Yeah, awesome. Um, That's my story. <laughs> I love that, I love that. That's awesome. And, uh, I love that. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we've got a few more questions I might be coming in. And for those of yeah. you guys who are watching, I keep seeing some people have been joining into the Zoom late and that's, that's fine. We see some people popping in and out of the, the Facebook live, which is also great. Um, so for those of you who are, who are still kind of filtering in and out, um, take some time to think about a question. Um, but before, while you're thinking on your questions, we're going to go back to that screen earlier about what we're here for, for everybody who joined late. Um, Rudy, do you, do you want to kind of take this one this time and talk a little bit about just kind of like why, why this matters to you? I know you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but just like talk a little bit about like, you know, when, when Jason came to you about um, this, yeah. this, this campaign and like, well, you know, you know recently, recently I, 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 you know, we lost because it was not just my loss, but it's a, it's a loss for a lot of, a lot of people, uh, Frankie Benali, who I, our, our friendship and, uh, and musical partnership began 48 years ago. We lost uh, Frankie uh, a little bit over a month ago to pancreatic cancer. And uh, he fought an incredible fight. Uh, he was given like six months back in April last year and uh, and he passed away in, uh, in, in August, you know. Uh, we also lost Ronnie James Dio in 2010. Uh, I, was his, uh, I was his bass player from 2004 until he passed away in 2010. And, uh, you know, cancer, it's, it's not just that, that it's, it's, it's horrible. It's also watching your loved ones, your friends, your bandmates, family, family members. I've lost my sister-in-law to cancer, uh, my brother Robert's wife. I've lost uh, my wife's dearest friend recently, Tracy, to cancer. And, and to see your loved ones just as they're fighting, you know, they're fighting to stay, you know, to, 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 to have the best life possible and to give the most to their loved ones. And, and, one of, and it's a very unusual experience because 
it seems like the more they're dying, the more they're living, the more love of life they have and, and understanding of, of how precious it is. You know, and uh, that that's a gift that they leave with us. The really understanding how how precious life is. Yeah. Heavy thing. So, so that's uh, that's why when Jason uh, contacted me, I was uh, I said, yeah. I'll come on, I'll do, you know, I always do whatever it takes, you know, to create awareness and to help out. And, you know, hopefully one day we can put an end to this, you know, horrible disease. Yeah. Absolutely, for sure. And again, just thank you for, for doing this. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, you're, you're Thanks to everybody great. for, for tuning in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to keep this up just for another minute for anybody who wants to, to go and, and donate. And like I had said earlier, um, you know, for those of you who maybe join a little bit later, um, Battle to Be Cancer, we're, we're hosting a bunch of events throughout the next few weeks. Um, you can go to battletobeatcancer.com. Um, Rudy was, uh, you know, was so kind to, to do this today and to spend some time with us and um, just hang out and, and also just share his story. So we really appreciate that. Um, the, the proceeds uh, for this campaign are going to the Lewin Fund to fight women's cancers. They're doing amazing work. Um, you know, just they're doing amazing work that is providing real world solutions to women who have cancer and, and their families, right? You know, so things like providing transportation to chemo and um, things like, you know, making sure that they have the services that they need to, to be okay and to, to focus on getting better, right? Um, yes, we all want to beat this thing and we all want to, um, to find that cure, but beating cancer is, it's about the cure, but it's also about, you know, treatment and it's about having that, that social support and that mental health and that, like, it's all those support factors from every single piece, right? And the Lewin Fund is, is really tackling that from every angle that they can. Um, and if you can't donate monetarily, then go to Battle to Beat Cancer and see what else you can do to help out if you want to hang out with your friends and host your own battle and just like goof off on your own Facebook and have your own live stream and get your friends to donate. And that's awesome too. So um, I'm going to stop sharing then and I'm going to see if we have any more questions. Uh, let's see. All right. All right, so uh, what's your favorite bass guitar? <laughs> Let me see. I got a, I got a room full of basses. I, I, I have about 35 at least. Uh, my favorite bass guitar, well, I, I have a, a signature model acoustic bass, a company called Sawtooth, which is very, very outstanding. Uh, I've been playing Spectres for a while now, and I love them. You know, I, I have a couple of signature models with Spectres, one of them with the Sims pickups. That one, that one always gets great response from, from the people that purchase them and play them. And uh, I've been using a, a Spectre with uh, Fishman pickups, which is a new technology that I really, really love too. Um, let's see, guitars, you know, it's, I have a, a, a Frankie, Frankie Benelli, uh gave me as a present uh, uh, a 1965 Precision, which I love, it's become like my, my favorite bass, you know, because not only because he gave it to me, but it's really a outstanding instrument, you know. Um, I got, Rickenbackers and Fenders and Yamahas and PVs and Thunderbird, Gibson. And basically, it's, I, it's, it's, you have to marry the song 
And by that, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I do a lot of projects for, for people all over the world. And they send me a track. And what I do is I audition my, my two go bases. Sometimes I might use a Hoffner. And there's a pop song, which I, I love my Hoffner. And, uh, or a five string bass if things are t in the alternate tunings, six string bass. What, what, whatever, you know, it's a matter of getting the, that character that the instrument has to match the cast of all the other instruments in the song. And that's how I approach it. Live is, a, is a something different because live is, I, I look for a bass that is consistent sonically through the set that complements all the songs that we play and complements the instruments in the band. So for that, I, I've been playing a few different basses uh, live with the Guess Who. Uh, lately, I've been using a Spectre with Fishman pickups, which I really, really, really love. You know, uh, Spectres are known for being really, really aggressive, which is great for that aggressive tone. But with the Guess Who, that's not really suitable because it's not a metal band, it's a classic rock band. So these uh, Fishman pickups, really sit in well sonically with with the um, the guess who music so i'm really i'm really i really enjoy playing that on the uh, you know with the guess who and that's my story good stuff I love it. <laughs> all right um i unless i'm missing any i'm not seeing any more questions but i don't know if are you able to see the chat on zoom if not i can read through some of the comments uh, um, Maybe. Yeah, actually, I, 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 I can't read the comments. I can see, see the, uh, the little faces. Okay. So if you guys, uh, if you are, then if you want to turn your camera on so Rudy can actually see you and say hi, if you're on Zoom. Oh, look, we got some people turning their, turning theirs on. There we go. I'll remove the spotlight so we can all... Say hi. So if you guys want to turn your cameras on, we can all say hi. What up to everybody? <laughs> uh, we've got someone, uh, let's see, uh, Mike Ebb is saying he's on desktop, so no webcam. That's all right. All right. Well, good to see all of you. <laughs> hey, Rudy. Rudy's muted. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I just unmuted myself. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad we could uh, say hi for, for a minute towards the end and everyone can, can show their faces and get to say anything. Rudy, is there anything that you wanted to say to kind of wrap this up? Jason, anything that you want to say to, to end this out? Or, um, we're uh, Rudy, at the end here. I just want to say, Rudy, I, I, I appreciate and love you for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime, you know, it's, uh, this is something that touches all of us, all of, all of our lives, you know, and uh, anything that we can do to, to end this, you know, cancer and create awareness, you know, uh, that you're not alone. You know, there's, there's many of us, you know, who are actually affected by this, you know. Yeah, let's let's talk about doing a song or something together with a bunch of folks and 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 donate. And yeah. See how it goes. Well, what a great idea! Yeah. That would be fantastic. Just anything yeah. we can do. Yeah. I, I really really yeah. appreciate you being involved. Yeah. 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 I just want to say, Mike B, you posted about you bet your own battle. Stay strong. Really stay strong. For real, man. All right. Well, with that, thank you all for, for hanging out and for, for helping out with this. This was great. Thank you again, Rudy and Jason. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, we'll catch you around. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Bye, Rudy. God bless. Bye, Rudy. Bye, Rudy. Bye, Rudy. Bye, Rudy. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Rudy. Bye-bye. Thank you.